Welcome everyone to today's webinar, 2023 Labor and Employment Law Updates, presented by Michael Schiatti and Ari Kowalski with Barclay Demon. Many thanks to our presenters, Michael and Ari, for being with us today and to all the participants who have joined in into our educational um, Simone Chamber Educational Series. Please note this webinar is being recorded to share what we learn with the business community. All attendees will receive the link to the recording. Uh, they will share the presentation with you, then follow with time for questions and discussion. Please use the chat to submit any questions during the presentation. Just a reminder, when others are speaking, please keep your audio on mute to minimize background, background noise. With that said, I'll turn it over to Michael to start things off. Thank you, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, which Ari and I have entitled 2023 Labor and Employment Law Update. You know, the goal is to sort of give you an idea of the recent changes in employment law here in, in New York. Some are in effect, some are upcoming. Um, there's a big change coming on sexual harassment. Uh, we're gonna be um, doing a standalone um, uh, on that uh, in and of itself. So um, we're not covering the sexual harassment update in here. That's probably gonna be next month's uh, program a, a, as, as we move forward. Um, as Beth said, if you have questions, put them in the chat and uh, you know we will uh, either answer them at the end or as we go along, it just sort of seems the ebbs and flows uh, of this. We have somewhere between an hour and an hour and a half uh, uh, of materials. Um, some of you will may be familiar with the pay transparency slides that I have in here. Um, the governor just changed the law before it went into effect, so we had to go back and, and, and change the presentation. It is a different presentation. They changed the law um, before it even went into effect, which I just, I, I got to tell you, I, I sort of laughed at uh, in, in that regard. Uh, my contact information is here, um, along with my social media information, and the same with uh, Ari's uh, uh, information and her social media. Uh, if you think of a question in the next day, couple days, and it's general in nature, feel free to email us. We'll, um, we'll get back to you uh, fairly quickly uh, in, in, in that regard. Um, the other thing I want to point out to you is uh, we have a labor and employment podcast. And, and I'll, I'll, when Ari gets to her part of the presentation, I'll let her tell you a little more about it since she hosts it for, for the firm. But it is a nice way to stay up to date with labor and employment concepts in addition to webinar, a much shorter format. Um, and, and again, I, I strongly encourage you to sign up and I'll let Ari say a little bit more about it. Uh, we also have um, a cyber SIP uh, podcast. You, you know, it, I, I always say cyber goes hand in hand with employment law because it is the cyber part of it is all impacted by your employees. So we'd encourage you to, to sign up for that one again as well. A nice, simple way to stay uh, up, to, up to date. So we have an aggressive agenda. Um, uh, I'm going to do the New York State Wage Transparency Law. And again, she just changed the law. She just signed an amendment the first week in March uh, before the law has even gone uh, in, in, into effect. Clarifies things a little bit, and I think it's going to help you plan a, a little bit better. Um, those of you in the city of Ithaca, you know, you've been working on this um, for, for quite some time now, um, but uh, this is the state law. It's coming down the pike. Then Ari will handle the rest. Uh, she'll go over the Department of Labor wage and, uh, wage and hour updates, new employment posters, new salary exempt requirements, new minimum wage requirements, uh, talk a little bit about the veterans employment poster. And now we have this concept here in New York of making available to employees in electronic format the employment posters. Uh, we have an amendment to uh, the, the labor law, Section 215, which Aria will go through. We have an expansion of the New York State Paid Family Leave Act. Um, we have a big amendment coming to the expression of breast milk in the workplace. Um, once we have the guidance from the Department of Labor, that will also be a standalone webinar uh, in, in, in that regard. But we don't have the guidance yet. Um, and when we do, uh, there, that will be a standalone. But we wanted to sort of alert you that this was coming down uh, to sort of help you better prepare in that regard. 
On the federal level, we have the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which President Biden recently signed uh, into law, and we'll review that for you. Uh, the COVID-19 update, please remember, the COVID vaccine leave expires in December of 2023, Why the COVID leave law is a permanent law and is going nowhere in, 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 in that, that regard. And employees are eligible for COVID leave uh, up to three times uh, as of right now under the most recent guidance. And we have uh, OSHA, of course, on the move um, and, and developing new programs and, and of course, increasing their fines uh, uh, every single year. So I feel like I'm dumping on you, but I am. Uh, it, you know, New York State um, is being fairly aggressive in expanding employment laws. And you have to know about them. Ignorance is never um, a, a defense whatsoever. Uh, so let's start with the wage transparency law. And again, if you saw my presentation prior on this, that's great, but it's changed. The governor recently signed a series of amendments to the law um, to, to sort of clarify it in, in that regard. Again, those of you, wage transparency is wage disclosure. You're sort of going to have to tell applicants what the salary range is. And we'll get to that in a second. It could be hourly, could be salary, it could be commission, piecemeal, or some combination, or piece rate, or some combination uh, uh, thereof. And we're going to have to disclose it in writing. Well, how do we do that? You're also going to have to disclose a job description. Uh, in, in that regard to applicants. Um, we now have clarification as to how we're going to do that. And, and I think it'll make your life a little bit easier. But remember, when we get to the job description in a second, the law does not require that you create a job description. The law simply states, if there is a job description, you're going to have to disclose it. My advice to you is either have an up-to-date job description or don't, all right? Never disclose a job description that is incomplete, inaccurate, outdated, or what have you. Um, if you have job descriptions, they need to be correct in that regard. A little more on that to come. So as an employer, we have to do some wage disclosure in our job advertisements. Um, it's designed supposedly to make uh, individuals more aware of what the starting pay is so that they can make informed decisions. Relax, I really don't think this is a big deal. I think it comes down to planning, understanding the nuances of the law, waiting for the Department of Labor to issue some more guidance in that regard. Uh, I just hope they don't wait to the very end like they have in the past. So the job description, make sure it's the essential functions of the job. You don't have to create it, but if you have one, you're going to have to disclose it. I am a fan of having job descriptions. I am a fan of having the job descriptions signed off on by the employee once they are hired. If they're hired and you update the job description, please make sure you have them sign a new version uh, of it. Again, more to come on the job descriptions. Supervisory training is going to be very important in this area. We're going to have to do a job uh, advertisement. The starting salary is between $50,000 and $75,000. Okay, that will be in compliance. Now, the individual comes and interviews with the supervisor. Does the supervisor doing the interview know what you posted? They must. You have to make sure that if the supervisor is asked what the salary range is, that they do not give an inconsistent answer in that regard. Please make sure you do some supervisory training on this. Also train on salary history discrimination. A few years ago, we did a webinar, and I'm sure it's available, on, on, on salary history dis discrimination in New York. You cannot ask what your current salary is, what your past salary is, of applicants, they're free to volunteer it, um, but you cannot ask them what it is. Put that in the supervisory training as well. Under the pay transparency law, there's this good faith affirmative defense. Now, let me put this all in perspective for you. You use that salary range of 50 to $75,000. At the time you advertise, that is what you thought you were willing to pay. 
Now there is a change of circumstances. Let me give you some idea what that is. Business is booming. Business is in the tank. Um, I get no good resumes. I get the all-star resume. So let, let, all, those are all changes of circumstances. So I'm initially willing to pay between fifty and seventy-five thousand dollars starting. Now make sure you understand that we advertise the starting range, not what they could end up in twenty years, not all the details of a salary schedule and a collective bargaining agreement. The starting range is what we want. I get a resume that blows my socks off. It's like, oh my God, this person's salary demand is $125,000. But I have never seen such a qualified applicant. I love him or her, and I want them to come work for me. And I offer them $125,000. Is that okay? Sure is. Why? The change of circumstances is that you've got a resume that in the, for you never thought you would see some all-star like this. You just have to be able to tell me why it is you paid them 125,000. Mike, she's got 10 more years experience. Mike, she's got four advanced degrees. Great, that's all I need to know. And, and we'll explain how it's gonna come up, but there is this good faith defense. So if you get the range right, but you hire outside of it on either side, you're okay. What do you mean either side? 50 to 75,000 was our range. The resumes we got were crap. Let, let's be blunt. They were all awful, except for one, which has a glimmer of hope, but I don't wanna pay her $50,000 because she doesn't have the exact qualifications we're looking for. I wanna pay her $45,000. I wanna go less than the lower end. Am I allowed to do that? Yes, you are. Same thing. You can go above or below. Don't, don't sweat it. You just have to be able to explain to me why. There is a document preservation rule that was initially in the law. It didn't make much sense. They have since taken that out. I'm gonna swing back to that at, at the end and tell you leave it in, um, in in that regard. And I'll explain to you what documentation you should be keeping. This law is nothing about more than planning. I want you to plan. Where are your job advertisements? Well, they're on our internet, our intranet. Uh, we use LinkedIn, we use Indeed, or anything else. First, locate everything. And then go in and modify these things in order to comply with the law. You can start now. We got some lead in time as you're about, as you're about uh, to see. Now, the plaintiff's attorneys of the world, what are they looking for? They're looking to sue you. They're looking to make money um, and, and what have you. So they're going to look, if you fail to hire someone or if you hire someone under the range, you know, they're going to be looking to bring claims under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, the Equal Pay Act, uh, New York State Equal Pay Act, Federal Equal Pay Act, labor law, uh, the alphabet suits. If you violate this law, it is going to be proof used against you in another context. You will also see in a few minutes that there are fines associated with this law um, that the Department of Labor can, can bring against you. New York is not leading the way uh, on these. Uh, other states, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Maryland already exist, Washington, Rhode Island. There are many local laws in effect uh, in the country, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, Toledo, Ohio, Jersey City, City, New Jersey. The laws come in two different forms, provide a wage range to applicant, sometimes only after the initial interview or upon request, or must provide in job advertisements. Um, New York falls into the second category, must pro provide in job advertisements. Um, there is no benefit disclosure required in New York. Um, there's a list of local laws I, I put there, uh, New York City, Ithaca, Westchester County, and now we have Albany County, and I think more to come in that regard. The laws apply to new hires, promotions, and transfers. New hires, 
promotions, and transfers. Mike, I have an employee I want to promote. I don't want to post the position. She's my person. I am promoting her. Is that okay? Yes, it is. You do not have to post a position under this law. It's not required. What the law requires is if you post, you must comply with this law. So just keep that in mind. Again, the good faith minimum and maximum, keep that in mind. I'm going to give you some uh, ideas. And there are some of these laws that do require benefit disclosure. We're not there yet. I think, um, I think it will come at some point, but not, but not yet. Um, wage disclosure and salary history, I've already mentioned that. And I've mentioned the local laws uh, as well. Why is it that the state of New York decided to put these things in as, lo as well as the local governments? A commitment to protecting um, uh, residents against discrimination. Uh, there's a well-documented racial and gender pay gap. Uh, research in this field indicates that pay transparency improves employee retention for employers. Uh, equitable employer-employee relations are a matter of public welfare. And basically, it empowers individuals to make personal financial and economic stability decisions on their behalf. Those are the rationales. I'm not going to debate them. I'm not going to say I agree or disagree. I agree with some and, and you know, might take issue with others. But it's something you have to comply with. That's, that, that's why, and I'm just trying to explain the background uh, to you. Okay, now let's talk about the substance of, of the labor law amendment. First, what is my lead in time? You have until September 17th, 2023, unless you're covered by one of those other local laws and your time's up. You, those laws are all in effect uh, right now. The law, the labor law, and I put the site up here in case you want it, I, I try to stay away from legalese. Um, it generally requires the mandatory disclosure of compensation or range of compensation by covered employers. Question one, are you a covered employer? What is a covered employer? Every labor law typically defines who an employer is, who's an employee. If you don't meet this definition, you don't care about what I'm about to say. Listen and wait for the rest of Ari's presentation. Basically, it's any type of business, corporation, LLC, a sole proprietorship, uh, et cetera, that employs four or more employees in any occupation, okay? four or more employees in any occupation and um, any entity uh, or entity acting as an employment agent or recruiter or otherwise connecting applicants to employers. They are covered. Um, an employer does not include a temporary help firm. I've given you the citation here intentionally. It's a very unique definition. I didn't know what it was. I had to go look it up. Basically, it means a business that recruits or hires individuals and then assigns them to perform work uh, elsewhere in, in, in that regard. So if you're a temporary health firm, you will not need to be uh, compliant um, uh, uh, with this law. That's who's covered employer. Let's assume you're a covered employer. Do you have covered employees is the next question. The new provision of the labor law does not have a unique definition of employee. So we default to the regular labor law definition, very generic, any person employed for hire by an employer in any employment. So it's basically all your em employees in, in, in that regard. Now, it's clear the New York law applies where the position will be physically performed, at least in part, in the state of New York. And that will end into a position that will be physically performed outside of New York, but reports to any supervisor, office, or work site in New York. So, as you sort of figure out the scope of this law, if the person's working in New York, covered. If they physically work outside of New York, but report to a supervisor, office, or work site in New York, that position even though in the great state of Hawaii or California or Texas or Florida is covered and you're going to have to comply uh, with this law. Again, a little homework. Where are your assets? Where do your people work? Where are you advertising the positions? 
to make sure you get it right in, in that regard. Now let's talk a little bit about employer uh, uh, ob obligations I've mentioned very generally, but here they are very specifically. And again, hire, job promotion, transfer, applies to all of them. You must, as an employer, uh, disclose the following in writing. The compensation or a range of compensation for such job promotion or transfer opportunity, number one. And I'm going to give you examples of that in a second. So the example that I've been throwing out, the salary range is 50 to 75,000. That's a perfect example. And again, starting, not what you will ultimately wind up making after 20 years. So just keep that in mind. And the job description for the opportunity, if the job description exists, it does not require you to create the job description uh, in, in that regard, it simply says, if one exists, you must disclose it. So again, keep that in mind um, and, and um, update your job descriptions, keep them up to date. I think it's one of the most important defenses that you as an employer have to ADA claims, and in some cases, wage and hour claims uh, in, in that regard. Okay, <clears throat> as I indicated at the start, the governor has already amended the law because it was a little vague and didn't really make much sense. So the initial law did not define the term advertise, but on March 3 of this year, they amended the law. So advertise shall mean to make available to a pool of potential applicants for internal or public viewing, including electronically, a written description of an employment opportunity. So, if I take out an ad in the newspaper, do you really expect me to put the job advertisement there? No, um, it's not feasible, um, but a link to how they can get it is what I think is gonna be required. And I think if you have an intranet or an intranet or Indeed or LinkedIn, you're gonna be able to put a little box to click. Here's the job description. And you are fully compliant if you do that. So I think that makes your life a little easier um, now that they've sort of clarified that um, uh, for us uh, in, in that regard. There's definitely more to come here, folks. Um, they have direct, the law directs um, the DOL to promulgate rules and regulations and to conduct public awareness outreach. Again, once we see the guidance or regulations, and if it's something that is a massive game changer, um, we'll probably just do a wage transparency event uh, just so you have the information and you can keep yourself uh, uh, up to date. Range of compensation. You gave us the 50,000 to 75,000 as an example. Um, I've mentioned already the good faith defense, um, the all-star applicant, no good resumes. The one thing I haven't mentioned is the defense is affirmative, which means you as the employer bear the burden of showing, why did I go above the range? Why did I go below the range? It comes down to just keeping some good records and some good notes and being able to explain it to me in the event of lit litigation. I will warn you, Equal Pay Act claims are troubling in that I sometimes ask the employers, why did you start employee X at this amount and employee Y at this amount? And they have no clue whatsoever in, in, in that regard. That's what I'm trying to avoid. Um, so make sure you give me something. Write a little note to the file. Put it in the personnel file. I don't care. Why was this applicant paid more or less than the range? Okay. Let's go through some examples of ranges. 52,000 to 100,000 per year. That's a perfect example. I think it's too big of, of a range in, 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 in that regard. Can I also have a fixed salary? I'm not moving, Mike. It's $75,000. That's what I'm paying. Yes. And you still got the good faith defense. You can go above or, or below uh, in, in that regard. But be careful with the fixed. Don't say it unless you mean it in, in, in that regard. How about some hourly ranges? We're going to pay 25 to 35 an hour. 
um, or I'm going to pay a fixed rate of $25 an hour. Th th those are ranges. A uh, quick little story. I, I, I mean, we all are having problems with getting employees that want to work. I think that's a nationwide concept that's going on. I was in Dunkin' Donuts the other day, and there's a high school kid in line saying, I, boy, I need a job. And I tap him on the shoulder and point to the sign on the wall starting $18 an hour. And he's like, oh, no, I, I couldn't take this job. $18 an hour is, is, is not enough. I need 25. And the guy in front of him turns around and says, son, have you ever worked a day in your life? He's like, no. And he's like, so what makes you think you're worth $25 an hour? And he just shook his head. I don't know what's going on, but it, you know, it's uh, interesting, the, the labor shortage that we are, in fact, averaging. Some of you have jobs that pay on a commission basis in whole or in part. Totally fine. You still got to comply with the law. So <clears throat> compensation for this position will be paid on a commission uh, a, a basis. You have to disclose that in writing. If there is some salary or hourly component, that needs to be in there uh, as well. I would be remiss if I did not point out to you and remind all of you that New York State has a law that has been on the books for probably 20 years called the Commission Sales Agreement Requirement. I gave you the site there in case you want it. Any employee that is paid a commission in whole or in part, must have one of these agreements. And I'm finding they don't, and it's a big deal um, uh, if you don't. The commission sales agreement must be in writing, signed by both the employer and the employee. It must describe in detail how the wages, salary, drawing account, commissions, or other money are paid. The key thing is how it is earned in, in, in that regard and how it is calculated. Um, if there is a, um, a draw or reconciliation, how often will it be, um, I, I, I guess, uh, um, you know, re reviewed with the employee to make sure they're not being overpaid or underpaid? Um, you must have in the agreement details concerning salary, drawing account, commissions, and all other monies uh, earned. Uh, and it must be signed in that regard. Now, let me tell you what is the problem if you don't have one of those? And this is a true case. I had a client that did not have a commission sales agreement. The employee filed a claim with the Department of Labor saying the agreement was that I was entitled to 100% of the commissions from the sale. $5,000, I get $5,000. The department, we, we ultimately settled, but the department was going to rule in his favor. Why? Because we must have a commission sales agreement. And there is a presumption in the commission sales agreement law that if you don't have one, it is whatever the employee says. So please, if you need assistance getting your house in order on those agreements, please do so uh, in, 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 in that regard. Under the pay transparency law, there is also a discrimination um, uh, provision. Uh, it's in every single New York employment law. No employer will refuse to interview, hire, promote, employ, or otherwise retaliate against someone for exercising their rights under the new law. Um, so if you don't give a salary range and the employee objects or the applicant objects, where's your salary range? I don't have to do that. Yeah, you do. Um, you can't retaliate against that employee because they raised that you were in noncompliance in, 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 in that regard. If you believe you've been aggrieved, the individual may file a complaint with the New York State Department of, uh, of Labor for, and request an investigation. There is no private right of action to be sued in New York State Supreme Court, but they're going to, the plaintiff's attorneys will use proof in those other claims, the Title VII, the Equal Pay Act, et cetera. Another nuance in this law, um, let me just tell you what the law initially stated. Um, and it doesn't state this anymore because they amended it. An employer shall keep and maintain necessary records to comply with the requirements of the new law, including but not limited to the history of compensation ranges for each job opportunity and job descriptions if they exist. The governor signed a law on March 3 that gets rid of that. I'm telling you to comply. Um, Title VII, the Equal Pay Act, and those other alphabet soup claims all have record retention requirements, which you have to comply with. I have a very detailed record retention list. It's about 
50 pages long. I'm not kidding. Five zero pages long. If you would like a copy of it, email it. Uh, email me. I'll be happy to send it uh, 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 to you uh, in, in, in that regard. But it gives you an idea of the massive amount of records that you as an employer must keep under the, the, uh, under, under the labor laws. There are fines that can be imposed on an employer. I'm not giving a range. The hell with you, government. I'm not doing it. Bad idea. Um, the, the fines, you, you know, they start out 1,000, 2,500, 5,000. They can get up to $20,000. Uh, don't screw around with this. You don't want to be fined by the Department of Labor. That's how they make their money uh, in, in, in that regard. Impact on local laws. All those other laws, Ithaca, New York City, Albany County, Westchester County, they remain in effect. The labor law does not supersede them. If you have assets in those other localities, you must comply with the local laws uh, as well. In, 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 in that regard. So please be cognizant um, of that. Let me just check and see, all right, if we have any questions. We do not. So I am going to put myself, uh, everyone, on mute and turn, oops, bear with me one second, turn my camera off and I will turn it over to Ari. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, Ari Kwiatkowski. I work with Mike in our labor and employment group here at Barclay Damon. Um, before I dive into the aggressive um, <laughs> rest of the agenda that I'll be talking about this morning, I did want to just talk about the podcast since Mike mentioned it. Um, as Mike said, we have a labor and employment podcast. I host it. We have a number of guests. We try to keep episodes 15 to 20 minutes, but it's really, really, I think, helpful. You can put it on your car when you're driving to work. Um, you know, we've we've had guests from the director of the EEOC, the Division of Human Rights, and some external external guests to talk about workplace issues, generational differences in the workplace, things like that. So I did just want to mention that Mike's been on um, several times, and uh, I think it's a good resource. So. I will go ahead and pick up where Mike left off. I'm going to talk to you about a number of DOL updates. I will start with the- um... Ari, I'm going to interrupt. Can yep. everyone, can someone, I can't hear you, Ari. I just want to make sure everyone else can. Can someone put in the chat if they could hear Ari, please? Yeah, I can hear her just fine. I can hear, yep. Okay, just me, go ahead. <laughs> no problem. Thanks everyone for uh, chiming in in the chat. All right, so this is a quick update and I'm sure a lot of us on the call are already aware of this. There's a two th 2023 minimum wage update for upstate New York, 1420 per hour. Excuse me. Um, you know, also the exempt salary amount. Again, I think um, a lot of us paid attention to this at the end of last year, but the state minimum weekly salary for administrative executive employees will range from $1,064.25 per week for employers in New York State to obviously the little bit of the higher amount for employees who work in Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester counties, and in New York City um, for any size employer, fast food establishments. I, I think most of us are aware that it's a little bit higher down there. So that's a quick update on an, the increase in minimum wage. Um, the next thing I think is important for us to talk about are the revised employment posters published by the DOL. Um, you know, if you go on the DOL's website, there's a good list of all the posters that you have to post in the workplace. There were some revisions to these posters that we've identified here. So I would urge you to just go ahead and take a look, uh, go to the website and make sure that you have the most um, recent versions of the posters, um, including the minimum wage poster. There is also a new poster this year. As of the beginning of the year, employers are required to post the veterans employment poster. Um, so if you are a public or pr private New York State employer and you have more than 50 full-time employees, this requirement applies to you. Um, you know the drill, you have to post it in a conspicuous place in the workplace. Okay, just wanted to check. Mike, I think it, it said that you muted me. <laughs> um, but here's a link to the veterans poster. This is just a veteran benefits and services poster. It provides um, some resources on mental health and substance abuse uh, resources, tax benefits, educational workplace, uh, workforce 
and training resources, things like that. So this is a brand new poster for 2023. Good to keep in mind because this is one that you will need to post in the workplace as well. Electronic employment posters. So this is another new requirement for 2023. New York Labor Law Section 201 has been amended to require employers to make available electronically any workplace notices that are required to be posted physically. So a few minutes ago, I mentioned you can go on the New York State DOL, DOL website and they give you the list of the posters that must be posted in the workplace. This is actually a new requirement. So I wanted to note that now uh, the requirement to post electronically is an additional requirement. So it doesn't mean that you don't have to post the posters in the workplace. It means that you also have to post them electronically. Um, you might be wondering, well, what does that mean? If you have a company website, that's fine. You can also email the, all of the posters to your employees. Um, what's interesting about this new law is that it does not address circumstances where an employer does not have a website or email addresses um, for all of its employees. So, you know, I think stay tuned on that. It's a little bit tricky. The, the um, you know, the, the DOL has specified that website and email are okay. So we'll kind of wait and see on that. Um, you know, there's also a notification requirement in this amendment, so employers must also notify employees that the documents required for physical posting are also available, available electronically. So that can be, um, you know, through a, for a company-wide email. You can actually stick something, if you have an employee handbook, stick something in the handbook to let employees know that you are now posting all of these required posters electronically. But I think a good thing to point out because there is this uh, requirement provision of the amendment. Let's move on and talk about labor law section uh, 215. There was amendment to that. This was effective last month. So this protects employees against no-fault leave policies. By that, we mean, um, you know, this has come up commonly in my experience where an employer may have a policy that um, assesses points for absences without regard to the reason for the absence. So under this new amendment, employers cannot discharge, threaten, penalize, discriminate, or retaliate against an, retaliate, excuse me, against an employee because that employee has used any legally protected absence pursuant to state, federal, or local law. So what does that mean? Um, bear with me here. Just want to go back. So that includes leave under FMLA, the paid sick leave laws under New York State and New York City laws, and the New York State paid family leave law. So this is basically comes into play where you have a, like a point-based attendance system and you're assessing points if you're an employer or potentially assessing points for employees who take uh, protected leave. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, you can't threaten, penalize, or in any other manner, discriminate or retaliate against, retaliate against an employee. For taking leave, you cannot threaten to contact or contact immigration authorities or otherwise reporting or threatening to report an employee's suspected citizenship. Um, you can't assess any demerit, occurrence, any other point or deductions from an allotted bank of time for leave. So that that's what I was referencing a couple minutes ago. Um, and I have seen this be, be an issue for employers who have those types of leave policies. And it doesn't mean you can't have a no-fault attendance policy, but I think if you do, it's definitely something you want to re-examine and definitely run it by an attorney because it can be a little bit tricky. We also this year have an expansion to the New York State Paid Family Leave Act. This was effective at the beginning of January. And basically, this is a pretty um, quick update, but it expands the list of family members for whom eligible workers can take paid family leave to care for, um, including siblings with a serious health condition. So that means biological siblings, adopted siblings, step siblings, and half siblings. And uh, something that the amendment specifically notes is that these family members or these siblings can live outside of New York State and even outside the country. So, you know, those of us familiar with the law before, siblings were not an included category of family members that you could take leave to care for under the law. Now siblings are fair game, so that's definitely an expansion to the law. The next thing I want to talk about is the amendment to expression of breast, pit, breast milk in the workplace. I think this is a big one. Um, as Mike mentioned, this is going to go into effect 
Um, June 7th, 2023, we don't have guidance on this yet from the DOL, but when we do, we definitely will do a presentation on that. Um, you know, you may be familiar if you heard about this amendment, <clears throat> there was also a, a recent federal law that came out. It was passed with the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which I'll talk about um, in a few minutes. But essentially, this provides expanded protections for workers who are expressing milk in the workplace. Um, under this new provision. So basically what we're getting at is employees who, who need to, to pump uh, during their shift or while they're working. So basically this is pretty expansive. This is very similar to the Providing Urgent Maternal Protections for Nursing Mothers Act or PUMP Act that I mentioned a few minutes ago, which was a federal law, but the state law actually provides uh, more expansive protections. So under this new amendment, there is no limit on the number of times an employee who needs to express milk in the workplace can uh, take or use to do so. Um, the, there's a change to the law to uh, have this apply to employees as opposed, opposed to mothers. And there are, are some expanded work, excuse me, expanded room requirements. So this is pretty important. There's These requirements are very specific. So under this new amendment, employers must have a designated private lactation space for an employee to pump that's in close proximity to the employee's work area, is near clean running water, is well lit, is shielded from view, is free from intrusion from other persons in the workplace or the public, and that contains a chair, a working surface, and an electrical outlet. So obviously, <laughs> there's a lot of accommodations that are addressed by this law. Um, but I think um, you know it's it's definitely important to point out if the space isn't used exclusively for pumping, um, it can't be used for any other reason while an employee is using it. I should point out, and this isn't necessarily new, but you know a, a bathroom or a restroom stall is not going to be sufficient under these new requirements. Um, there is an undue hardship defense, as we note here. That defense does not apply, though, to the employee's need to take breaks to pump, but it can apply to these other specific accommodations um, that I mentioned a couple minutes ago, which, you know, depending on the size of your workforce and the, the size of your office space and, you know, the demographics in your workforce, obviously these, these requirements are pretty expansive and can be burdensome. So, under the new amendment, the DOL will pub the commissioner uh, will publish a written policy. That will be the model lactation policy. We're still waiting on that. Um, and under this new amendment, employers must disseminate the policy upon hiring and annually thereafter. So there is a distribution requirement under the amendment. In addition to that, if you have an employee who goes and takes leave, um, say for uh, family leave, parental leave, when they come back to the workforce, they also must be given a copy of the policy at that time. Uh, as I mentioned, we're waiting on new guidance and that sample policy. And of course, as one would expect, there is a discrimination provision in the new amendment, which basically says that you cannot discharge, threaten, penalize, discriminate against, et cetera, any employee for um, using the protections under this new expansive law. So definitely. Um, I think definitely expansive, like I said, a little bit more onerous as expected under New York State than the federal law. And I think we really, we need to wait on the guidance for this one, um, but certainly want to pay attention to. While we're in the realm of the um, pregnant workers and protections relative or new protections for pregnant workers, I wanted to mention the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. So this is a new federal law, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it was passed at the end of last year, I think, with that, the PUMP Act, which I mentioned. This is a new federal law that applies to employers with 15 or more employees. This law will become effective June 27th, so a little bit of time to prepare, but I don't know about you, but I can't believe it's almost April, so I think June 27th will be here before we know it. Um, this is a new federal anti-discrimination law, as one might expect. It will be enforced by the EEOC. You're wondering what's the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. I'll call it the PWFA, although I don't know it's any shorter <laughs> to say the W, but basically think ADA, but for pregnant workers. So under the new law, covered employers must provide reasonable accommodations to a worker's limitations due to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. 
Um, you might be wondering, well, what does that mean? What accommodations are we talking about? Some examples that the EEOC has provided include the ability to sit or drink water, receive closer parking, have flexible hours, or additional break time to use the restroom. And I should note that the EEOC has not issued quote, full on guidance for the PWFA yet, but there is a Q&A that they've published. And I think it's seven or eight questions, just general questions about the PWFA and how it will work. Like the ADA, there is an exception for undue hardship. Um, and I think the guidance, the forthcoming guidance from the EEOC will be helpful to kind of tell us what we need to know about that. But definitely, um, you know, a, a new law, I think it's important to know if, if you're thinking about the PWFA, you're probably wondering, well, why, how is this different from Title VII? How is this different from other federal laws? Because we know that there, there can't be discrimination on the basis of gender. Well, that's true. What the PWFA is really seeking to address or protect are accommodations that a pregnant worker may request and the request for accommodations and the requirement to provide accommodations isn't actually covered under those other federal laws that just those federal laws say, you know, you cannot subject the pregnant worker on the basis of gender to um, different work um, conditions and things like that. So this is kind of filling a hole. It is different um, and we'll have to see what the EEOC says about it. I would be remiss if I did not talk about COVID-19 leave laws. Lots of questions. Um, I still get lots of questions from clients about what's going on with these laws, what's going on with the paid sick leave law. As um, you know, Mike mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the COVID-19 leave law is permanent. COVID-19 vaccine leave was extended until December 31st, 2023. So this year, as you may know, under that law, I think it's employers have to provide <coughs> up to four hours for each injection or each shot for um, employees who go during the workday to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. So this is kind of a quick update, but I definitely wanted to mention it because still we're still getting a, a few questions about COVID-19 leave and it's definitely here to stay. So definitely worth mentioning. I will wrap up by talking about some OSHA updates that we expect are coming. Uh, you know, OSHA had a number of updates last year. We anticipate, and in fact, OSHA has said that they're going to, you know, be coming out with a number of pro proposed rules um, this year. So we put these on our 2023 items to watch list. Oop, where did the slide go? It's okay, it's the last slide. So I'll just kind of run through <laughs> this quickly. So, you know, OSHA has proposed a record keeping rule here. Let me get down to the bottom here. Okay, there we go. A record keeping proposed rule. So this is for a hundred or more employees in certain industries. Um, OSHA is proposing that they be required to electronically submit injury info. So this is forms 300, 301, 30A. For those of us who are familiar and that would be an annual requirement. You know, a lockout tagout update. I think we're really talking about computer based mm -hmm. safety controls, which a number of industries and employers use, and OSHA is kind of lagged behind it. And I think they're trying to get up to speed on that. A silica update. So, OSHA planning to include medical removal provisions, um, you know, the regulatory activities on heat exposure, um, coming up with a formalized heat standard for uh, industries where that's applicable, and then the HASCOM proposed rule. So, we will keep you updated on these things, but these are definitely things that we flagged in 2023 that we think OSHA will definitely be making rules on and will be um, and will be um, forthcoming for sure. So I think that's the last of my slides. Um, I know we gave you a lot of info, but we wanted to hit everything. And I see that there are a couple a couple okay. questions here. Mike, right, can you, you hear wanna... me? Yes. Okay. So um, let, let's go through some questions. I, for whatever reason, I can't hear Ari, so I don't know what happened there. So I apologize uh, for, for that. Um, let me say just a couple things. Um, the, the first question I see here, when you say COVID-19 leave law is permanent, are you saying under FEMLA or separate? It is a separate law. It has nothing to do with FEMLA. FEMLA is a federal leave law. The COVID-19 uh, paid sick leave is a New York state law. Um, the law itself is silent as to how many times someone can take COVID leave. Um, the COVID leave is a separate leave bank. 
so that if someone gets an isolation or quarantine order, each time the employee is capable of getting up to 14 days of, of, of paid leave. Not that they will automatically, that it's up to. You have to look at the quarantine order or, or the isolation uh, order. If you'd like the guidance issued by the New York State Department of Labor, just email us. I'll, I'll be happy to do it. There's two types of guidance. One is for healthcare, and the other is for uh, everyone else in, 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 in that regard. So just because um, we're stressing um, the COVID law is permanent because everyone thought that when the governor undid all the executive orders that the COVID leave law went away, it did not. Uh, it, it, it is simply uh, a permanent in, in, in nature. Um, let's see what else. Let's see, question wise. Okay. So there's this one question I don't, um, does this include attendance being noted in a performance merit review potentially giving smaller increase? I think I just need a little more context, Kelly, as to the, the, the question uh, it, it itself. All right, let me turn it over to you for some comments on any of those questions while I see if I can try to get to hear you. Sure. Um, no comments on what you said about the leave law, Mike. Um, Kelly, so I think what you're asking is if uh, this includes uh, noting attendance with issues in a an annual merit, uh, like an annual performance review. Um, I think you, you know, if there have been, if the employee has had issues with attendance, I think you are, you can and should note that in the annual performance review. What this law is really getting at is if the employee is taking protected leave under the statutes that we mentioned, um, and you have like a point-based system, you cannot uh, assess a point, assess points for the employee taking that protected leave. So if you have somebody who, you know, is habitually late or habitually, you know, ha has is a no call, no show, I think you can and you should note that in their annual performance review. This is really getting at more if you have an employee who, you know, is on a is on a leave or has to take leave, you cannot assess points if you have an, that type of um attendance system um, because the employee is taking protected leave. So if you have an employee who has habitual attendance issues, habitual, you know, uh, is habitually late, like I said, I think I think that's fine. And you, you should definitely note that. So I called a number of folks um, on that matter in regards to like a PTO type system. And so I've got in mixed advice um, from uh, a few different attorneys, and I'm hoping for a tiebreaker here, <laughs> um, since uh, Mike is my favorite attorney in all the land, um, hands down. Um, but the question is, if we have a, a PTO-based system and they use time for like vacation, right? and they are left with less than 56 hours for PSL protected uh, 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 eligible absences, do we need to, um, one, is it, does it become indefinite for um, those PSL uh, leaves? Uh, two, do we need to make sure that they've been given 56 hours under those designations or three, are we okay just to um, keep it as a PTO system since that's how the law was written that we could do a PTO system? Yeah, I'll tell you my thoughts and then Ari can chime in there. I, I'm not sure there's a right answer right? and I'm not sure there's a wrong answer. Um, you can keep it as a PTO system. So you lump in vacation, personal and sick. Law is crystal clear right? right in, 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 in that regard. Um, the The, I think the law presumes that it is going to be the employee's obligation to balance the leave, meaning you got, the, you got, you know, you have this bank here. It's for sick time, personal time, vacation. Use it wisely. And, and I think you're, you're okay. Um, I'm a fan of segregating them out, having, um, going away from the PTO, having like a vacation, personal leave bank, and then the sick leave bank. So it's crystal clear what the leave is being used for uh, in, 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 in that regard. Is that, it's more for me for record keeping that, that I like them segregated as opposed to combined. I have no problem if you wanna combine them. I think the, um, 
the the concern employers have is is that Johnny uses all his PTO as vacation. Now right. he gets sick. Right. So, um, but now I think that's the employee's problem. So let's assume for a second they get sick. Um, do they have any sick leave? No. The law says then that you default to unpaid sick leave. And you can count that against the employee because it, it, it turns into unprotected leave uh, at, at that point. But you also have to be cognizant of the other stuff. Is there a FEMLA issue? Is there right. short-term disability or workers' comp going on? Is there a car accident involved such as, such as no fault? Do we have paid family leave being implicated? You sort of got to look at all the banks and say, what's available here? And then just to sort of go back to the COVID, the COVID leave bank is separate from right. sick leave, PTO, and personal. It is a totally separate bank, which should not under any circumstances roll into the PTO. I don't think that is allowed in, 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 the, in that regard. So, uh, John, is there a perfect answer? No. Um, and, and um, it, you know, Ari, what do you think? You, do you, do you, are you a fan of the one bank or, 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 or the two? I personally, Mike, agree with you, and I am a fan of the two. I just think that it makes it a little less complicated. Um, but I think in the questions that we've gotten on this new amendment and how it's applied, I, I wholeheartedly agree with your, uh, which is the answer nobody likes to hear, but is a very typical lawyer answer, which is there might not be a, a straightforward answer to yeah. the question. But unfortunately, right now, that's kind of what we're left with until we hear a little bit more. Yeah, and it's not great advice. It's not perfect advice. I, I mean, th that's, the, that's the problem, um, which I don't like some of the things that they've done with paid sick leave. Let me give you an example, John. Then when they issued the final regulations, they dropped in a bunch of comments. And in one of those comments, they talk about paying out paid sick leave every year, which goes against what the law says. But right. now the department seems to take the position, it's okay. I, I think it's crazy. Um, some other questions that have popped up, uh, it's all related to the same thing, COVID. Is the COVID sick leave requirement per year or cumulative to employment? The New York State COVID emergency sick leave law is three times. That's it. It's not three times a year. It's three times overall in that regard. Once an employee has used COVID emergency sick leave three times and they get sick again, it goes to your regular paid sick leave or your, if you have that combined uh, uh, PTO. Now, some of the things that could happen here is don't be afraid to designate something tentatively as paid sick leave. And then you get more information and you're like, oh, it's really COVID. And I go back in and I adjust the, the data. That, that's happening all the time. I, I, I think that's what you have to do to be prudent. Another question that popped up, is it 14 days per calendar year? It is not. The individual is entitled to COVID leave up to three times. Each time, the person is entitled to up to 14 days, not that they need all 14 days, because you're going to see a quarantine or isolation order. Some are using five days. OK, you know, I just came out of quarantine. I needed 10. Um, I, I needed 10 days uh, to, to, to get out of uh, a quarantine. Um, it differs person by person. I am also seeing 14 day quarantine order still. I, I don't know why, but I, I'm seeing them. So you got to look at the order to see what it is. Um, and then it's going to be some combination of paid uh, COVID sick leave, and maybe there's still too sick. Like I haven't been back in the office. So if I was an employee, I'd be on paid sick leave right now because I've already used uh, the, the little COVID um, uh, block there. Um, let me see, there's another question here. Okay, so do I only need a quarantine or isolation order to get COVID leave? I don't think so. Um, the first time can be a self-attestation. It can be a positive test result. And you sign that self-attestation saying, I have COVID. I am of the belief that given the guidance issued by the Department of Labor, 
that the second and third time in order to get COVID leave, it must be a positive test that is not self-administered and not self-read, meaning you need to go to a healthcare provider like a well now or your doctor. Yep, you're positive, uh, and, and that triggers uh, and, and and that triggers it. And what I, I we tell people to do is um, self-report to your county department of health. Um, most, but not all, county departments of health will then email you a quarantine or isolation order, and that is what should be provided to your employer in, 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 in that regard. So there are other ways to get it, but I think if you review the guidance from the Department of Labor from like, like March 2021 or whenever it was issued, the second and third time implies strongly you need that positive um, result from a healthcare provider. There's also something troubling. If you send Johnny home with the sniffles, is that COVID leave? No, I don't think so. Um, but you may, you, you gotta be careful. There's a line in that COVID leave law. I'm sorry, the COVID guidance that states, don't remember exactly what it says, but it says, dear employer, if you send someone home because you think they're sick, you gotta keep paying them their regular wages. You gotta be careful about that one because we want to trigger one of the lead banks in, 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 in that regard. We don't wanna have to keep paying them the regular salary without hitting a, 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 lead, a lead bank. Um, let's see, a wonderful question here. If an employee doesn't provide healthcare documentation, do we need to pay them? Well, if, if they do not give you the documentation needed to trigger COVID, you do not have to pay them COVID leave. Then if they say they're sick, that triggers regular paid sick leave and you're going to hit their bank there. If they have no paid sick leave, it is unpaid leave, which you can count against the employee in, 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 in that regard. So you sort of, what I sort of do is say, have a chat with them and, and you need X paid sick leave. I think it's... Um, you can make them sign an attestation form that the leave qualifies as paid sick leave uh, in, 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 in that regard. Um, another question that's popped up, is there a New York state level tracking system for the three times for receiving COVID leave or is that just per each employer? It is per each employee that the employer has. So it is the employer's obligation to track the number of leaves, to track the leave banks, and to make sure the employee is paid out of the proper leave banks. We are seeing some employers who don't have a COVID leave bank and have just been hitting their paid sick leave. Um, you're gonna have to go back in and fix that. There's a email complaint mechanism that employees have, and it's very easy to complain to the Department of Labor. I don't know how far behind they are. They are really far behind um, in, in enforcing that, but it, it's there nonetheless. Ari, anything you'd like to add to anything I've said? No, Mike, um, I, I agree with everything and thanks everyone for the questions. These are good questions. Yeah, I don't think I missed any. Let me just make sure, I think, okay. Um, okay, well, Hearing no other questions, what we'll, we will adjourn. If you think of something else, email us, okay? This is meant to be uh, uh, educational. Um, if you need the COVID guidance, happy to send it. If you need the record retention requirement, happy to send it. Um, I think we're planning another webinar for um, a late um, April. It will be on the proposed sexual harassment uh, updates. I mean, I, I thought the last one was over the top, but here we go again. I, I think the policy is going to like double, not double, quite double in size, but like become four or five pages more. Um, and hold on, we just dig out one more. Can you clarify documentation for paid sick leave we can request from employee? You really can't. Um, days one, two, and three, you, you can't ask for anything. All they have to say is, hey, I'm sick. All right. And that's going to trigger it. 
after day three, I th and I think it's three consecutive days, I'd have to go back and, and, and double check, um, you can ask the employee to sign an attestation form. All that is is, yeah, I'm taking the leave for one of the reasons in paid sick and, and safe leave law. Um, if they've also requested FEMLA short-term disability, you can give them the FEMLA paperwork and you can give them the short-term disability paperwork. And if they want that leave, they have to fill it out and complete it and get it back to you. And that will give you the additional information. I don't think it's particularly fair to an employer um, uh, on, on paid sick leave, how they've handcuffed us. Unfortunately, that that is what we're dealing with. And, and um, th there's really no way around it. Warn your supervisors, don't ask for documentation. Um, we, you know, we, if um, paid sick leave at its extreme can be used for the following. Hey guys, I'm tired. I, I, I need a mental health day. That's the legitimate use of paid sick leave. I, I kid you not. And, and it, it's a brave new world and we just have to sort of put up with it. Um, if you catch the employee doing something they're not supposed to be, let me give you the example. Did you ever see the, uh, the guy that gets fired for going to Colin and sick and going to Yankee Stadium on opening day and getting caught on TV? You can fire them. There's no problem for that. You're, um, you're out at lunch. Your employee called in sick and you see him shopping over at Wegmans. Can I fire him? Be a little careful. What if they're there to pick up prescriptions um, for, for the, their sickness? I think you can at least ask, what are you doing here um, uh, in, in, in that regard? So use a little common sense uh, in that regard. The other way we're seeing people get caught is on Facebook or social media. Um, they're on vacation. They just called in sick and they're posting, uh, you know, a picture of themselves from the beach. Save the Facebook posting and you're free to act on it. Um, let's see. It's slightly, oh, did you see this? Uh, will the salary level amount um, go up in 2024? Yes, it will. Um, they won't publish it quite to the end of the year. Every single year, this thing, the salary amount and the minimum wage have been going up. Whenever you see a minimum wage increase, there will be a increase to the exempt salary amount. No if, ands, or buts about it, folks. Um, it, it will happen. Can I guarantee that? No, but I'm. we've been doing this a long time now. And I have seen year after year that New York salary amount increase, 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 and, and increase. And I don't think there's any end in stop. And I think we have five or six different salary levels now in New York, depending on, on where you are. Uh, in the state. I'm glad. Let's keep the questions going. I'm fine with that. If an employee calls off sick for three consecutive days, can require a medical release for them to uh, return to work. Uh, we definitely can require a certification um, that the leave that they took was for paid, uh, was for one of the re reasons there. It may not be a medical reason, though. They may have been um, working with a prosecutor to prosecute their husband who's a domestic abuser. Um, there's no medical note from, from, that, that comes back uh, from that. Um, I think I would shy away from getting the medical release because it may not be a medical reason. And you're not allowed to inquire as to which of the specific buckets it falls into on underpaid sick leave. So be be careful uh, in, in, in that regard. Now, if it's a workers' comp, if it's short-term disability, we got FEMLA involved, of course you can ask under those rules for whatever documentation is necessary for them to come back. So when you, for instance, when you fill out the, um, the FEMLA paperwork, when you authorize FEMLA, um, there's a question that I forgot exactly how it's worded, but it says something like, uh, will you request a, a fitness for duty certification? Yes. Always check yes. Um, that will give us a very broad option to get a very broad medical background that this person's ready, willing, and able to come back to work. And I think it only helps you in, 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 in the long run in, in, in that regard. And FEMLA also be careful of the job descriptions. Uh, attach them to the certification forms that you want the physician to complete. Uh, make sure they're up to date. Make sure they list the essential 
uh, functions uh, uh, of the job in, in, in that regard. So again, I know I'm giving you information overload, but eh, I think you'd rather hear it than not hear it. Um, I see no other questions. Ari apologizes. She had to run off and run to court. Um, any Anything else, anyone? Okay, Beth, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you. Um, we will share the link to the recording with everyone later on. We'll also include the handouts and any other links um, related to the webinar. Uh, you can visit shemongchamber.org to register for upcoming webinars or find recordings of previous webinars. For anyone interested in chamber membership, please contact the chamber at info at shemongchamber.org or call 607-734-5137. Many thanks to Michael and Ari with Barclay Damon and to everyone for joining us today. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Take care.